Hello everyone and welcome. I'm Naveen Agarwal. This video is a recording of an interactive Q&A session we just had very recently on the topic of risk management for medical devices. Now risk management continues to be a challenging topic even for those of us who have been in the industry for many many years. So the intent behind these interactive Q&As is to engage in a conversation, in a dialogue. And sure enough, we had a very engaging conversation about certain topics related to risk management. And this is not going to be the only Q&A session. We will have more in the future. So you can watch the entire video at leisure. It's about an hour long. Or you can follow the timestamped links as part of this video to scroll forward to a question of interest. So I want to invite you to take a look at it and I hope you will enjoy and learn something new. If there are more questions, please let me know and I look forward to meeting you again on our future interactive Q&As. Thank you. So, um, okay, uh, again, following up from last month, big news, our forum is up and running and I know many of you have already joined. Those of you who may not know about this, uh, we started this because we got the feedback that we wanted more frequent dialogue and interaction. And it's not always possible to bring everybody together in a live session. So I felt like it might be useful to set something up as a discussion forum online. So at your time, you can look at the posts and you can respond to them. And as I said, many of you have already joined. So it is really up and running. For those of you, again, who may be new to it, this is a closed forum, meaning like it's open to membership and I review and approve every request that comes along the way. We, we want to keep it, you know, kind of small and uh, uh, constructive. So very few rules, but we really want to make sure that the right people are joining in terms of their interest and, and experience. So rest assured, we will keep a close eye on it and make sure your experience is is useful. What I would encourage for those of you who have joined is uh, engage in the forum. Uh, there are already a couple of uh, very thought provoking, I think, topics that have been posted, uh, one very recently from Ed, and that does touch upon post market as well. So make sure you are looking at it. And if you are not able to get notifications, you let me know because there might be an issue of settings. It's just a new system for us. Uh, there is a, there's like a, a slide deck that I have prepared on the forum that tells you how to change your settings or profiles. But let me know. Reach out anytime. So you can reach uh, the forum through my website, exceedqm.com. And I can also send you a link um, as part of the follow up. Okay. So, uh, yes, we start with a few submitted questions. And before we get um, into Kathy's question, which was, I think, pretty interesting, uh, I want to kind of set the stage for all of us in terms of what are the requirements for PMS in ISO 14971. For you, this may be a refresher, but I thought all of us can be on the same page with this. In my mind, high level, three key points, right? The points are really information collection, information review, and actions. And here are a few key bullet points. And it should be systematic and planned. That's what the standard is requiring. So you must collect the production related information, non conformances, maybe internal CAPAs, uh, user generated information, whatever you are hearing, maybe from patients or doctors, information coming in from installation and maintenance, supply chain, anything that's publicly available. And in, on that front, I would say um, maybe social media is now. A place to keep an eye on as part of your post market surveillance too and i would love to hear more from uh, you guys how you are managing that anything that relates to state of the art maybe standards or guidances other actively collected information that you do as part of your post market surveillance process and very quickly review review the new hazards and hazardous situations now this will be a question for ed a little bit um, later I didn't notice the term new harms. What happens if new harms are detected? So let's, let's uh, uh, make sure we focus on that, Ed. Revised risk no longer acceptable. If you find that your revised risk based on new information is no longer accept acceptable, you need to review that. Overall residual risk no longer, there's a typo here, acceptable with respect to benefit risk and changes in the state of the art. So, you know, 
all the right things that they want us to do on an ongoing basis. Interestingly enough, the actions are in two groups. For medical device, review the risk management file and update if needed, reevaluate previous controls, and need for actions for devices on the market, maybe corrections and removal. So you have to consider that. But they also want you to look at the process, evaluate the impact on prior risk management activities, and use this as an input for suitability review by top management. So I, I actually want, I know I went through uh, uh, a lot in, the, in terms of the requirements, but what I would like to do is just really, really open that up. And again, we will get into the question, Kathy, that you submitted. Oh, no worries. Uh, but um, if we can talk about this a little bit, uh, particularly some of the topics that I raised. Um, and I, I think this is pretty consistent with uh, our overall understanding of what the new requirements are. They're pretty extensive requirements, right? So I opened the floor. I think I raised two points, one about the social media monitoring. The other one was about what, what happens if you detect a, or identify a new harm. How are you supposed to manage that? So uh, floor is open, guys. Well, you want me to start, Naveen? Yes, go ahead. And I know Bijan has all, uh, also joined. Welcome, Bijan. Yeah, I, uh, go ahead, Bijan. No, I just I was trying to find a link to the meeting. It took me a while to get here, so sorry. <laughs> No, just problem. no problem. No problem. Bijan, we just went through like high level requirements for post market in 1497 2019. And I was opening the discussion with just a couple of key points that I know this personally and maybe have, have some understanding and then open the floor for discussion with everybody else. Okay, I'll listen for now and then maybe I'll join in. Okay, thank you, Bijan. All right, Ed, go ahead. Yeah, I, I worked on that section of, of the revision of, of 14971, uh, which is clause 10 in the new uh, the 2019 version of the standard. Uh, and um, you need to look at 24971, which as I think it's uh, ended up being four and a half pages of guidance on that, which is one of the longer guidance sections uh, in uh, 24971. Um, we had tons of questions about this, and at the same time, uh, the regulators were changing their approach uh, on this, and um, post-market surveillance became a big, uh, important aspect in both the U.S. and in the EU. It, it doesn't show up so much in the U.S. because, of course, we haven't uh, revised the regulation yet. But there is guidance um, that the FDA has released on uh, benefit risk uh, that, that delves into uh, the uh, post-market activities like uh, recalls and uh, 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 MDR reporting and that kind of stuff. So anyway, it's a big topic. It's an important topic. And probably... Uh, Naveen, what you uh, ran into is we probably overlooked the word harm yeah. in there. I think it's there. Yeah. Intent is there. It's just not mentioned in the standard. Well, uh, working on a standard, uh, until you've had the experience, uh, it's a lot of, a lot of effort. Um, 14971 um, had well over 100 people working on it. Yeah. Uh, we met uh, three times a year face-to-face uh, uh, -face, uh, in different parts of the world. We met on every continent, uh, except maybe, I don't, I don't think we went to Australia, but um, we were in Korea, we were in uh, Israel, uh, we were in uh, uh, Brazil, um, London twice, uh, the U.S. a couple of times. So um, when... Uh, when we had our meetings, it was always open to the locals there. So that's, uh, I know our last meeting in London, London, we had 63 people in attendance. So mm -hmm. a lot of information, a lot of, a lot of interchange of ideas and, and uh, uh, good input uh, into the standard. So um, where I'm going here is uh, we, we spent a lot of time on this. Um, the uh, clause 10 group, 
met um, every other month online, as well as the three meetings a year virtual or face to face. So we spent a lot of time working on this, and um, it's. I think maybe when we looked at hazardous situation, we figured that covered the harms too, but yeah. it really doesn't. So, so what, I'm, what I'm hearing you say, Ed, then is, you know, just because the word is not there doesn't mean that we should say, hey, we are not going to look at new harms. Right. right. Absolutely. Do. If and, anything, right. anything changes, you need to take that into account and go back. And, and that's what the standard tells you. If you get new information, you need to look back at the existing ri risk analysis and determine if it's been invalidated. Yep. And that's the, the three questions uh, that yeah, uh -huh. came from the 2000 edition of the standard. Yeah. They're still there today. The only change that was made there was we added state of the art. Yeah. So I want to ask uh, other people, you guys, like, how do you pick up on new harms and in context of the coding that you use? And this is a very specific question because in my experience, I've seen many times the max, the highest number is under the bucket called other because there's no term. So how do you guys do it? Anybody who wants to share uh, some of the best practices there? Come on, let's, uh, anybody who would like to kind of just chime in because I, I think this is, this could be an important topic. Okay. Can you just clarify what exactly you're asking? I know with MDR there's some coding, there is coding requirements. Is there for complaints oh, and, and that? I'm not I see. Yeah, no, let me clarify yeah, that. Not for, internally, yeah. many companies all, uh, internally companies have a code that they use in their complaint handling system to code new information coming in from patients as complaints or documents. Mm -hmm. And usually they might use a code for a harm like pain or headache or you know uh, injury or whatever. But they also have a category called other. And in my experience, I've seen a lot of complaints being categorized under <coughs> other because there is no term in their coding system. So my question was, uh, in general, how do you guys keep an eye on new signals from the marketplace in terms of harm? Like if someone is reporting a new type of an injury that you didn't know before, how do you keep track of that? Um, Naveen, um, Bijan here. Um, th this is a problem. And so new harms that are discovered are logged. They just uh, may not have a code. Yeah. Uh, so the problem is that right now we are going toward using the IMDRF codes uh, as the internationally recognized set of codes. But IMDRF doesn't have enough codes. So then there, there's another set of codes called MEDRA. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that one. MEDRA is a better, more richer code set. Um, so mm, I think companies have internal set of codes. They're trying to use IMDRF codes, which is, I think, insufficient at this time. MEDRA is in the background. Um, but it's not that the harms are going unnoticed. It's just... Uh, what code are you going to attach to them? Mm -hmm. And uh, it is a challenge that I think many companies are struggling with right now. Mm -hmm. What about what about others in the group? How do you guys um, handle this? Do you guys, are you guys familiar with Medra? Would you like a little bit more discussion on that? I hi Naveen. Um, yeah. yeah, I have experience with with Medra. Um, you know, in a previous uh, role, Medra being used for our internal complaint coding. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, when you're, when you're doing things like filling out the, the FDA form 3500 or the MIR form for the EU, you know, you have to kind of use, uh, their code. So for the EU, you have to choose the IMDRF, I think it's Annex E and F codes to indicate what happened to the patient. Um, and with the FDA, you have to use their patient problem code. So it's, it, mm -hmm. and it does lead to confusion sometimes, um, when your internal system isn't harmonized. Or, or mapped directly to the IMDRF and the FDA. And yeah. um, my hope and what my understanding is that is that FDA is going to, uh, at least is somewhat mapped and harmonized to IMDRF and would ultimately um, simply simply use IMDRF. But I agree as well that that, that is not always adequate and, and all the harms aren't always there. And I think, I think, um, they have a code, right, for, for harm, for, 
for harm not available or symptom yeah. not available. I can't say I've encountered that um, in the devices that I've, you know, um, worked with. Um, but sometimes it's not perfect and you, you kind of have to pick, yeah, you do kind of have to pick the best option. Mm -hmm. And um, the other thing that seems helpful um, is, you know, to work with your complaint handling team internally and try to develop some um, standardization, right? Yeah. So, and that's, that's kind of something I've helped with uh, from a clinical aspect of, okay, well, you know, when do we use this harm and when do we use this severity versus this harm or this severity and try to come up with something standardized that, that people can point to. So there's not so much kind of inter observer subjectivity when, when assigning yeah. harms and, and severities. For sure. So this is an ongoing thing, right? And just to share with the group, yesterday I attended a day long workshop with the FDA orthopedic uh, division. They were doing a uh, public education awareness workshop on post-market processes and they did talk about this issue and in fact they're asking help from the industry to be more specific in their disclosure and they shared that they are working on harmonizing to the idea. I think uh, one of the one of the problems Naveen uh, and all is um, computers uh, we we've, we've required now the use of codes and we don't yes. have a place for a, uh, a text description. So um, what might be helpful is, yeah, put the code in, but then beside it have a text description of exactly what the problem is because yeah. uh, you need that information to update your risk management file with new information that comes in and you, you want the exact description of the problem, yeah. not the code. Yes. It's helpful for sorting and that kind of thing, but the real help is in the text description of exactly what's going on, for because sure. that's that's where the where you find out uh, about the problem is from the text. And Aaron is right about uh, you know there needs to be some work with the medical uh, safety group about establishing the terminology for severity uh, and uh, use a standardized. Uh, list there uh, clear back at the beginning of the risk management process. I've seen that successfully done in a number of companies and they've really benefited from the fact that um, there's standardized terminology in their risk analysis uh, for severities. Uh, so um, that, that's a great uh, uh, input so, there, uh, Aaron. Let me ask others on the, on the forum. Are you guys familiar with the record? I know we talked hey, about Hey, I mean, this is Abdul. Uh, are you able to hear me now? Yes, we can hear you better, much better. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I actually switched to my phone. So, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, what we have been doing is every time we see something unusual or something that is not what is listed, uh, you know, definitely we would, uh, uh, we would go directly into the risk management file, try to find the exact line item, try to reference that in the complaint to show that we have uh, something uh, in our risk assessment that we have assessed this kind of risk before. If not, add or update the risk management file to include you know, a new harm along with their assessments within the risk management file. But I feel the new uh, 2019 uh, guidance and the, and the standard, uh, I think the, there is uh, additional emphasis on, you know, periodic review of risk management files, which was not, you know, as, um, um, as I mean, it was there previously, but it was not probably taken that seriously because like you are always constantly updating your risk management files. But that annual review or like whatever periodic review we're gonna, we're gonna be having, probably the things that are, you know, not knowingly gone into other bucket or things that we have missed, we will be able to revisit them at a periodic basis. And you know, if we have missed anything, we have not included. We can you know bring that back into the file. But then you, know. must, then you uh, must define Abdul in your procedures what that periodic update, update or review yep, should, in, yep. what should include. Otherwise, people are gonna maybe sometimes do it. Yeah, skip it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We are actually you know working on our uh, work instructions and procedures to update to the one, uh, 2019 requirements. And uh, uh, that's one of the things that we are going to highlight within the. Wonderful. Based on the. the 
based on the complexity of the product and you know the number of uh, harms we see or you know complaints we see for a particular product we're going right. to define uh, a period a period between which you have to definitely revisit each and every assignment file yeah so i want to touch upon the med reports that bijan uh, introduced and i have worked with them uh, how about you guys the rest of uh, you on the forum are you familiar with them have you used them and i am not okay kathy good um so it would be worthwhile to kind of go over them a little bit quickly bijan do you want to take that on i um, uh, i hate to put you on the spot but if you would like to share some perspective on how you have seen that used in the past and i will also add to that based on my experience okay uh, well um metro codes is a set of codes and and i'm not an expert on this by the way uh, i just will tell you what i have run into metro code is a pretty rich set of codes that were names and uh, adds a code to a variety of uh, patient conditions uh, harms in general uh, and what I found is that they have uh, a lot more codes available than uh, MEDRA, uh, than uh, IMDRF. Um, but, uh, so they basically, they have a uh, uh, seven digit no, or an eight digit, an eight digit code uh, that uh, describes a variety of things such as, you know, syncope or coma or busyness, uh, things like that, uh, which are patient harms. Um, it's, an, it's a medical device, a dictionary, basically. That is, I think MEDRA stands for Medical Device um, something Regulatory Dictionary. Uh, dictionary, Medical Dictionary for Regulatory Activities. I just posted in the chat. Okay, yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's it. Um, as I said, I like it better because it has more codes, uh, but it seems like the whole world is going toward use of IMDRF codes, which are really nicely structured, but it's not populated enough yet. Uh, mm -hmm. In the appendix E of uh, uh, IMDRF, uh, you will find a correlation between IMDRF codes and MEDRA codes, uh, so you can tell which goes with which. And I think IMDRF is trying to follow, to, to some degree, the, the same names, uh, names of harms. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the interesting, I'm going to just diverge a little bit from uh, this, the question now about the MEDRA, about something that Ed uh, was just talking about, which is about a definition of severities. Uh, this is another challenge yeah. because a harm can have a name. You know, let's say you can have um, uh, meningitis, but uh, to different degrees of meningitis are also of interest. If it's just a small or a serious, or it could be like life-threatening, um, the description of the severity of a particular harm itself, at this point, I don't see it available because mm -hmm. in IMDR for meta, they give you the name of the harm, but not the degrees of severity. And that itself is, a, uh, at least I've seen it in my, my own company, it's a huge challenge to get these various doctors to agree. Yes. yes. What, is, what is critical? Yes. Uh, what is uh, like serious or major? Uh, and I, I think this is going to be one of those things like trying to write a law, you know, like Ed was talking about hundreds of people trying to opine and who, who wins. Um, it's a great challenge to solve, but it's, it's not an easy one. Yep. Thank you, Bijan. So let me, let me share. Uh, uh, so far, anybody else has any further questions before I get into sharing my experience with you with Medra and, and severity assignment? So, N Naveen, um, um, I'm very new to this, so that I have never heard of METRA before, so um, thank you for sharing this information. Is METRA kind of freely available? Can you do a search on Google and get it, or how does it work? You have to subscribe to it. Uh, the, oh, okay. the structure of the dictionary essentially is, uh, you know, this, it's a database. And database okay. every six months, you have to subscribe to it. And it essentially, uh, like Bijan was saying, it's a lot of codes, but most importantly, they're organized, system organized, conditions, preferred term, lower level term. There's a structure, a hierarchy, and it is very medically focused. So doctors understand it better than engineers. And I'm an engineer, so I have no problems, you know, accepting that, that limitation in my understanding. But I work very closely with doctors in implementing this internally. Uh, into our system. So I'll go into a little bit more, more about that. Neon, does that, does that answer your question? 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, am I correct? I think what we're trying to get at here in a sense is trying to say, you know, we have IMD or F codes and we have the MEDRA codes, but our risk management documentation in terms of how we're defining harms may be defined completely different because, you know, we're working with different con consultants. They're not looking at these databases. Yeah. They're going on their own opinions, etc. Yeah. So yeah, I just was trying to just work it out in my head because, yeah, our system is definitely not aligned in any of this, to be honest, um, because we would rely on external consultants yeah, you're not alone. to come in. So, yeah. You're not alone, mm. yeah. What I'm trying to say okay. is when you work with external folks, make sure you are requiring them mm. to use a standardization approach that would be useful to you in the long run. Mm. Yeah. Nothing is perfect. Yeah, I got you. I got you. Yeah. Because here's what his experience I'll share with you guys. I worked on this project now for two years. And mm. the first thing we did was working with doctors to standardize the harms table. We look at the complaint codes and doctors realize that for the for a same or similar condition, over the years, the com internal complaints database had evolved into having multiple terms for the same thing. Imagine you have hundreds yeah. coming in through the year and they're all scattered into these tiny codes. You cannot do any meaningful analysis, first of all. So uh, they themselves brought in the concept of MEDRA. They were experienced in their past and they said, we're going to look at MEDRA and we're going to aggregate, consolidate our complaint codes and map them to appropriate MEDRA terms and also map them to FD and Andia, which what Aaron, you were talking about is that all kind of standardization activities are going on all the time. Mm. What is important is that realize you have a gap and work to try to fix that and make as much. Uh, you cannot change the complaints handling system also overnight, right? You have an automated system, maybe you don't want to change all the code. But you need to create processes that will take those and map them to some standardized codes. And MEDRA is fast becoming. In fact, I was interested to see FDA using MEDRA routinely. Now, when they reported data about vaccine safety, if you look, look at the reports, they are doing analysis using MEDRA classification system. So it is, it is being used by regulatory authorities. And it is only, I believe, a matter of time when all these different regulatory and standard bodies come to terms with what should be the, the standard language. I'll stop here. Any questions, comments, further uh, discussion on this topic? Very important topic. Yeah, well, one more thing I'll say about MEDRA. What I found, you know, unless you, unless you do have clinicians choosing mm -hmm. these codes, it can be tricky. Maybe. And I, I, I agree that it's helpful to have um, more codes, more detail, but the problem sometimes too with too many options is what you said, you know, various people are choosing different things. Um, yeah. You know, when you have, uh, you know, multiple different ways to characterize a gastrointestinal illness, right? And you have people choosing six different lowest level terms and so yeah. that that's kind of how medra is it organized it starts with your highest level term which is gastrointestinal diseases and then it narrows and narrows and narrows until you get to vomiting but i just i, I wish i had a good example at the moment but i just recall there being times when i would review what was chosen and um, especially when it comes to things like infection right there's there's so many different nuanced choices that it then becomes difficult, as uh, I forget who, who previously said, to analyze the data because you have multiple different choices. And that's the one benefit I do see to, to being more general, like with the IMDRF, because you can at least pull, you know, or do a data query, for example, um, you know, and narrow, narrow the field down. And then maybe, you, then maybe you have to look into the complaints to see what really happened. But sometimes with MEDRA, I, I do think it, it because it's so detailed, you can end up with a lot of variability. Very, very good point, Erin, and work with clinicians. Uh, here's one of the examples I'll share with you, not a specific terminology, but an example of a challenge. Like Erin like mentioned, it's organized at a higher level at a certain types of organ or a system organ level. At the lower level, the similar term may appear in another system organ class. So you should not be selecting a lower level term from a system organ class that doesn't apply to your device. Otherwise, you will be looking at publicly available data, which I believe in future is if you are following the trends, 
real world data, real world evidence is going to be big. And FDA is going to rely on post-market, pre-market decisions based on RWD or RWE, what they're talking about. So if you're going to mine the data, be aware of the right codes and it requires certain expertise. So I don't want to kind of really confuse people uh, too much, but the key takeaway in my mind is whatever you do internally, work to develop standardized methods and constantly review as part of your process. Are you being redundant in your terminology? Because you will get confused. You will not know the frequency of occurrence precisely or accurately if you are scattered all over the place. So try to standardize and always, always work with people with clinical and medical expertise when it comes to these harm terms and severity. Again, I'll stop here and see if anybody has any questions, comments. I want to add to that statement. That's a very important statement, Naveen, is that severity needs to be done by uh, clinical people, not by engineers. Yes. Engineers have no clue as to how to identify severities. So yep. use your, your uh, uh, medical and clinical people to establish that. That's, yeah. I've well, seen so many problems from that. Well, on that, on that also, Ed, Bijan brought up the point that among medical folks, there are disagreements. And that's, that's, that's okay. You can use Delphi, Del Delphi techniques. And Bijan, you yes. do a fantastic job of describing that in your book. So you could have methods and involve the right people. Okay, guys, I know we have 15 minutes left and I want to make sure Kathy gets information on her question. Now she is here. I had a slide, but Kathy, I'm going to kind of open the floor to you. And again, I don't want to cut it too short. We'll continue talking about it in future. But I want to make sure that someone who submits, uh, takes time to submit a question, do get an opportunity to hear from others. So Kathy, would you mind talking about your question or do you just want me to show you, show everybody on the slide? Um. Well, I had I have another question. Okay. <laughs> now that you mentioned that, um, so ahead. we've been asked to do some real the RWE. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a a consultant clinician that went through the risk management report. They didn't do a, a they did not submit a plan. They did not you know they didn't do any of the first two steps: the plan, the analysis. They just went straight to the report. And they, high, they made the codes higher or the probability of harm higher based on their experience and not based on any clinical data. Got it. Just mm -hmm. we think this, so we're kind of going back and forth because we did one report with them on another device, the same uh, supplier, and it was fine, but now this person is, has come in and just um, kind of blown it all up. Mm -hmm. So we're using the RWE. And then my second, the other question I had was the one that I presented to you. Um, I, I know the EUMDR is now requiring a validated cleaning and disinfecting. And I don't think that that's new. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I believe that that uh, has always had to be validated. But, you know, we're trying to uh, emphasize to this team that I don't think they can just use post-market surveillance to... Mm -hmm. You, to claim compliance to a validated method. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But that's yeah. where I wanted your opinion. Great. Thank you, Kathy. I will, um, I'm sure uh, people will have a lot of things to contribute to this, but let me make a very quick point about your uh, question that you asked related to probability of harm and being, that being changed by consultants based on experience. I think the question to ask back is, what is that experience based on? Are they looking at a data source that you are not familiar with? Have they done an analysis or is it just pure, you know, I've seen so many times kind of a statement because uh, they work for you, not the other way around. So you need to be asking them, please show us the data, your analysis based on which you are giving us a new uh, assessment of probability of harm because maybe that'll, uh, they have a sound reason for doing so, and I would not second guess anybody. Uh, I would just say, ask for it. Uh, yeah. ask, for, ask for the data source, the analy analysis, or a reference. Maybe they have some literature they have reviewed. Maybe they have looked, talked to key opinion leaders. Maybe they have some field experience. Uh, whatever they are telling you, uh, make sure you get the, the background story and compile that and only accept it. So I hope that that helps uh, you figure out what to do next. And I, I would... Naveen, let me add to that. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and you, you pointed out correctly, uh, the consultant is working for you. It is your right to accept or reject their opinions. It is up to you to make the decision. You're the ones that are going to be held responsible by the regulatory bodies, not the consultant. So never just blindly accept what they're saying. And as Naveen has said, uh, ask for their, their basis and, uh, and also as for their experience, uh, I'll tell you, uh, I have found a lot of uh, consultants whose experiences in, in, uh, have been 15 years ago when they worked in the OR. Yeah. Well, gosh, uh, the OR is a heck of a lot different today than it was 15 years ago. So put everything yeah. in context and you make the decisions, not them. Mm-hmm. And, and we have done all those things, and they're just very stubborn that, you know. Uh, so um, if you were to use this, this device and the patient coded, you're supposed to remove the device so that there are no RF, you know, anything in the way. And he just, they just basically said, well, I wouldn't do that. I would just go ahead and try to revive the patient. You know, I mean, they're very, very mm-hmm. uh, stuck in their in their thoughts and they haven't given us any real uh ex- real data as to why i mean and they upped the harms and severity just across the board based on that's not right and i said well you can't just do that you know you have to like well, tell yeah. us why I, uh, you know i would you know why <laughs> Somebody had a clip. It's not okay. ours. It's the OEM. You know, we wish that, and that this is the problem, right? Like when you're dealing with, uh, you know, suppliers and and that that we you don't have that much control over their personnel, and so every time we come to the table, it seems like they have a new clinician. Somebody else had a point there. Please go ahead. Was it Neil? Yeah, no, sorry, I had a question there for Kashi. I'm just curious, Kashi, are these current practicing um, physicians? They are current practice physicians, are they? Or are they kind of physicians who kind of are retired? And I are think kind of that doing it's, a, it's a retired clinician. Okay, the, I would be very careful on that. I would really caution you on that because I heard of a notified body um, giving a finding um, going back not so long ago, actually, um, on CEO approvals and review where the, um, the it was a, a clinician, all right, but they weren't a practicing clinician. They were retired for several years, so they hadn't, kind of like what Naveen is saying, they may not, or, or, or Ed is saying, they may not be in the real world. You know, things change, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, be car- I would be cautious on that if they are retired, how mm-hmm. real data is and how current they are with current practices and as i said i've definitely heard of of um of notified bodies giving giving findings um to people um, for their consultancy services uh, for something like that i think what i would what i would recommend kathy uh, just to kind of close out on this part of the discussion is uh, review your your processes for uh, evaluating suppliers a consultant is a supplier for you mm-hmm. Right, so it's part of your purchasing control. You need to be able to say what is your selection criteria. They should not. They should have some current experience. They should have some qualifications. So, I would say take it, take this feedback, and work around this situation using that approach. Say where where should we put some controls, uh, either on our OEMs or, or suppliers or whoever we are working with, that the personnel they hire to do all this work, they go through some kind of a you know check and check and balance. That might make sense in a way that you could control through the QMS. Yeah, and then to further complicate it, we have the, um, the new RA person that uh, doesn't respond well when we mention the 24971. You know, they just say, well, in their mind, it is just a guidance and they don't have to use it. And so, I said, you know, how, do you, how do you go back then mm-hmm. and... Uh, verify that with the EUMDR. I mean, how do you go through your GSPR if you're not using the 24971? Because it's very important that you that they link and that you yes. connect them. Yep. So again, this must be very frustrating. And I've seen this play out <laughs> many, many times in, in practice. Uh, sometimes these discussions are not necessarily uh, due to a, a you know, gap in logic or, or understanding. There might be some other factors. Yeah. 
So um, I do yeah, have uh, one other one other point to Kathy's question, as far as you know, since certainly I've been in the role of of providing input to the the probabilities and the severities, and you know, one thing I think is important. I'm not sure if when this person is providing input to probability, if you are at the point yet where you're splitting it into a P1 and a P2, or whether it's an estimation of just the overall probability of harm. But I find when you are when you do have that in your process to split it in, okay, what is the probability of the hazardous situation occurring? And then what is the probability of that hazardous situation leading to harm? I think it's a good balance when you really have the, the maybe the engineering and the risk management people kind of owning the P1 and the clinical people maybe owning, you know, again, everyone has to be flexible and listen to the other side, but kind of owning that P2 because mm -hmm. that's when you can really say, okay, well, you, you can tell me from an engineering standpoint, what is the likelihood of this failure occurring and, and, and whatnot, but I can tell you once it occurs, you know, what is, what is the likelihood that that could lead to a harm for the patient? And then you have kind of a balance from both sides of input into the question. Um, and yeah, I do think it's appropriate to say, okay, well, if you think that the probability of the hazardous situation leading to a severity for harm is, you know, falls in our scale at a two, like provide some data. And there often is data, right? When you have mm -hmm. a contaminated Foley catheter, what is the likelihood of that leading to infection? I mean, you can find data on those things. And um, so, yeah, I think it's appropriate to, to, to push and ask for that kind of rationale. Yeah, so that now we're doing the uh, real world data as well as a uh, PSA, I think it is. Wow, that's or PHA. You have your hands full, Kathy. We wish you. <laughs> it's a tough one. So, hey, uh, do you, did you guys want to? We do have a little bit more time. You want to address the second part of Kathy's question about using post market surveillance information uh, for verification validation of reusable devices? Kathy, I think yes. you, were, you were kind of already um, moving towards a direction that you kind of felt that what the answer was, but you know, I want to make sure it's um, you hear other people's opinions as well. Yes, I I would give mine right away. No, <laughs> no you. That's why. That's uh, why I, I love having you. FDA says everything is underreported, so uh, right away uh, that's a problem. Also. Uh, I've read a lot of uh, MVR reports over time, and most of them have no information to help you uh, with decisions. Uh, it's, it's just not um, something that uh, will support uh, verification and, and validation activities. Uh, those are, uh, they're helpful. They give you some input about, okay, here's a problem. Well, is that, do we have that problem identified in our risk analysis no well maybe we need to add that and then we need to research it and uh we may need to do some uh, uh testing and we may need to do some validation activities but you don't accept it on face value as as completely accurate and 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 complete because it's not so uh it's just an indication there's an area we need to explore more than anything else Mm -hmm. Ed, I would I would say if you if guys let's think about it. Post market surveillance information is more about what went wrong, mm -hmm. and validation and verification is about what is going to go right. So I think it's not the right yep. data to begin with. We are trying to prove something to work according to a certain performance expectation in ver verification validation, whereas PMS data is always going to tell us how it's not working well and what rates are being being indicated for failure so it may be possible to use given the restrictions or limitations ed has talked about it may be possible to use some data to establish a baseline performance or expected performance and then say my validation must exceed this or should be better than this mm -hmm. right? something like that let, let me uh, uh, contribute contribute from a, a different uh, direction, but I, I think this is very important. First of all, the basis for uh, 14971 Clause 10 and also ISO 1345 Clause 8, which is CAPA, 
is the uh, GHTF Kappa guidance document, which has a whole lot more information in there. But in both the regulation, uh, the, the 1345 and 14971, we insist on an active process of collecting data. You don't wait for the phone to ring, okay? You have to have an active process for going out and gathering information. For instance, when we would introduce a new product, place I work, we would assign a, a service person to a, a site that we were going to introduce the product. They would be responsible for contacting or even going to that site every week and collecting information about how the device is performing, what kind of problems there are, uh, those kinds of things. And we did a limited release of product. So uh, typically we would have uh, sites in the Northeast, the Southeast, the Northwest, and the Southwest, and, and also the central part of the country uh, of the US. But um, we found there were a lot of differences uh, even between hospitals. So we went to small facilities and large facilities because the experience level and the usage of the devices was different between those facilities, just as we were talking a little bit about the recent experience of clinicians. Uh, the the uh, uh, doctor that performs a surgery in uh, a hospital in a large city like Mass General in Boston that's doing these things um, maybe 10 to 15 times a week is much different from the rural hospital uh, that is doing it uh, maybe once a month. Mm -hmm. So uh, you have to gather that information and balance it based upon that, that uh, experience. And, and you need to actively collect information, especially on a new product that's just released because you don't know for sure. Uh, you got design validation, but you're exposing it to a larger population, um, uh, people that have different experience levels than that key uh, person that you use to design the device. Uh, so you, you, gotta, you gotta go out there and find this stuff out. Now, as the device is on uh, the market a lot longer, and you have a lot of experience with the device and, and things are settling down, you can back off a little bit, but you still need to have an active uh, process for collecting data. It is no longer acceptable from the regulators or uh, through the standards to have passive uh, data collection. That's just not uh, going to work. And what I did was I presented them with a, uh, a recall for a supplier that did not have a validated cleaning and disinfecting pol uh, clause in their IFU, and so they had to do a recall. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did yep. you yeah. Kathy, does it help? I want to make sure you, oh, yeah. you, you get the information. Mm -hmm. you're looking for. That okay. definitely helped. So, guys, again, uh, unbelievable. When we get together where our hour just flies by, it's always a pleasure. So I know we will never be able to fully answer everything in this one hour discussion, but I do appreciate you guys engaging and I really want to invite you. Several questions were posted on the chat. I really want to invite you to uh, engage on the forum. Uh, I, I, I'm telling you this could be a very good way for us to continue our dialogue. Uh, we, are, we are going to be keeping a close eye on the discussion, making sure it's constructive and positive and your experience is useful. So I hope you will take a look at it and engage. Uh, really looking forward to that. And last but not the least, if there are uh, you know, any topics that you want a special focus on, like an hour long focus with all of us, just write to me or post it on the forum again. Hey, consider this as a thematic theme topic for our next discussion. Anybody has any closing comments, thoughts, feedback? Yeah, nope. be sure and post on the forum. Yes. Yeah, no, I must, um, we must start using the forum. Um, I have to be admit, admit I haven't engaged yet, but I do plan on doing that. I think um, that will get a lot more discussion going amongst the group. So um, thanks, Naveen. A very good session today. Thank you. Yep. Kathy, Erin, 
No, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Great Abdul. discussion. Thank you. Yep. Thanks a lot. It was great discussion. Valuable experience. Your time is valuable. Yep. Definitely. Good work. Okay, guys. Uh, we'll talk soon next month. And but let's keep the conversation going on the forum. Have a good one, everyone. Thank you.